going to stop drama in coaching the 14th of progress. Okay, so um, this is me, I left with Bob Smith, um, and um, a colleague from ICE, which is an institute of contemporary and cultural enterprises, or something like that. Now, uh, arts happening and all that stuff. I remember once in a room describing themselves as academic, so I asked if I could steal that as a sort of It's not mine, it's you. But um, I do a number of things, and um, the things that I do, I deliberately blur the boundaries between them. So some people would say, when I'm performing, I'm teaching, and I'm teaching performing, it's with research. The last one on the list, I didn't realize I did until a couple of years ago, which is being a coach, um, whatever one of those things is, and as a human being, coach, not you know, a van. Just <laughs> um, and we'll come and look at a bit what that might be a bit later, but it probably a lot of us in this room are in one way or another coaches without realizing it. And we probably have an idea of what it is and what this thing we're about. And, um, there's recently been a BBC documentary, hasn't there, about coaching, um, where there is like some kind of cult, a wicked cult. So if any of you end up drinking the cool aid tonight, then you know, and I'll sign you up for the rest of your lives. The families will try and escape the drama of coaching cult. I doubt it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is talk about this proposition this afternoon. Um, and this came from the fact that when I discovered this whole field of coaching, particularly coaching in education, I spent last year doing a postgraduate certificate at uh, Peckham Carnegie School of Education at Leeds Peckham University, which is the only one in coaching and mentoring for education practitioners. And I worked with a lot of other teachers across the range from early years through to other people teaching universities and youth workers, people who were involved in the sector, and got really immersed in the whole field of coaching methods to psychology and all that stuff. And every time, as someone who's worked with education and drama, we come across something, I go, oh, surely you're using a bit of Dorothy Coates Mantle of the Expert, we might talk about that later. I'll just drag Mantle to talk about it because she's the expert on Mantle of the Expert. Or perhaps you're using forum theatre, or perhaps you're using any of these other techniques. No. You Google it, there's no discernible research on the use of drama and methodologies in coaching. So my proposition is now's the time. I'm going to see what you think of that as we go. So I'm going to start off, this is going to be a little bit interactive, but not hopefully in an exposing way. But I wanted to ask you to do a little sort of exercise. And this could be something, if you've got something to write on, you could write, you could do it in your head. And what I want to do is think of a sentence, any sentence, do not censor yourself, the first thing that springs to your mind that starts with the two words, what if, okay? And this is a prologue, this whole um, talk is kind of structured a little bit like a play. I'll get onto the three act structure in a minute, but this is the prologue, this is before we do anything else. Yeah. Or the end of the show. this is to get you warmed up. So, just think of any sentence that you can that starts with what if. There's no right or wrong. Uh, in English, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> but other than that, be interesting if people speak other languages and uh, whether this works. I say English. What if? And actually, what you might want to do is turn to somebody and share what those sentences are. So you get sort of introduce yourself, say, hello, my name is, what well, your name is. And my sentence is, what if, and I'm not going to give you any exemplars because I don't want to you to be influenced unduly by it. Well, I might go, what if? Yeah. It's you. Hello. That's one of my students in there. How are you doing? I'm hidden in the non-video part. Okay, uh, this is about oh, years. I wonder where you got to. Are you doing the exercise? Yes, mine is what if things work out? What if things work out? 
Very good. That's radical. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Someone had to look after my mum today. She's got labyrinthitis. It's lovely to see you. Have you managed this? Have you managed this? Have you got one? Everyone got one. Um, my stream has fell online. Hello. So there, are, to, uh, there are currently eight people. Oh. Yeah, we've and got you eight might want to online my participants. Let's do the chat what their more tips are for online. What have we got? What's the things that we get? Online participants, if you'd like to put in the chat your what if sentences. Oh, so, welcome. Just, just in case everyone's late, there's no way of getting in if you know that. It just so happens somebody had to do it live and had a voice. I was only like one minute after. So, I don't know if Oh, do you want to wait? Uh, Molly was waiting Molly. there, but everybody came in at half past. So, um, yeah. We'll edit this bit. Okay. <laughs> that goes on to the YouTube. Okay. Um, what have we got? So, what is this? We had something very philosophical and something very personal. Tell me exactly what they are. Okay, that's, uh, <laughs> but, um, I, I just thought, what if we tried something different? So we tried something different. Interesting. And mine was, what if this connects positively with my book? Oh, oh. It's positively with my book. What else? We, we have from what, uh, online what ifs. So Isabel says, what if things work out? Um, Arnie says, what if the world were flat? <laughs> um, Chris says, what if I could do everything? And Carla says, what if the UK was a republic? Yes, and for anything, so what, what you notice with a lot of these is, is optimism. Huh? Have you got any that weren't optimistic other than the one I tried out with my friend in the garden? Nothing not optimistic. My friend in the, uh, my friend who's interestingly enough, a therapist and a musician, and I was first off, he said, What if Russia invades Belgium? Uh, <laughs> And I said, you're a bit, you, that's your, you're a catastrophizer. Um, and my theory, and I'm trying this out in lots of different ways, but just as a simple exercise, is that there's probably a third one, which you might get with kids more often. Yes, the fantasy. That's, what, if, what if the moon was made of bubble gum, chins, or, you know, that kind of thing, the way the imagination goes crazy, doesn't it? With, with those other things. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, what's interesting about this question for me is, um, and I'm very new to studying psychology, I'm really on the nursery slope. So if anyone who understands psychology here, that would be, um, it, it will be most of you, yes. But one of the things apparently that psychologists do is they often write things that start with a sentence. Homo sapiens is the only species that mm -hmm. right, to differentiate us from animals. And um, people used to say uses language, and then we discovered that isn't true. Right? And then they said, oh, uses tools, and that's not true. But um, the various psychologists that I've read think that we may be the only ones that project into the future with our imagination. Um, hence, so this is a map of Daniel Goldman. Says this in a book called um, Stumble on Happiness. And um, it's kind of an interesting thing, isn't it, that we have this kind of unique fantasy of what if. But it, it's not always a good thing for us. Our, our imaginations play tricks on us. But even us, those of us who are optimistic, optimism can lead to disappointment, can't it? Um, how many of us have worked with students who say, whose what if their imagination is? Particularly if you work in the, the field of theatre as I do, I will be starring in the West End. Yes, maybe, and maybe not. Um, so there can be unrealistic expectations of like the future that can lead to disappointment. Um, and catastrophizing, of course, can lead to inertia, anxiety, depression, all kinds of stuff. So 
I want, before we get on to that one, I want you to meet Celeste. Celeste is one of my students. Yes. The difference between Celeste and all the rest of my students is Celeste is fictional. Okay, so I, what I've done is what playwrights do. <coughs> and what I do, I've done is what playwrights do. Um, we often do is we create amalgam characters out of things that we see in real life because that's what we do. Yes. Quite a lot of the time. So um, this, tell me if you recognize Celeste and the kinds of things. So this is, say I, I was a, was a Senior tutor, quite a while, but if you do the past the work, which is, you know, you see students maybe not always at their best. These are kind of typical things they say. People who work in universities might recognize this, but you might recognize this from other contexts of learning and working with, young, working with human beings. Last essay was only a two word, hardly fulfilling my potential, is it? Um, this is in a things bubble. It could be in a set, but often then I'll probably end up stacking shelves and being skinned. What's in my degree? This is the kind of thing, particularly during the pandemic, people were students were feeling very, very anxious and depressed. I told you about my sister, right? Lord at Oxford, always a straight A student. Do you think that's a positive statement? A positive thing? What? Not in the context. Not in the context. So this is this is poor old Celeste was having a difficult to turn it up. Um, anybody else from the university might know that just every time, maybe it's different in education, who knows? But certainly in other departments, we yeah. So if you are, I'm gonna put you in role now as Celeste Tutor. What do you think is your instinct for helping her get out there in the morning and get in? Which year is she in? She's in her third year. Struggling. It makes with a difference. She, it makes a difference. She's struggling with that. We know she's not right at the beginning because she's already got it too well. But the last essay she had, she's not good enough. I think I'd ask her what she saw her in the French class. I'd rather suggest that. It's somebody else's idea of her potential. That's fine. Oh, that's interesting. So she's got other people. Yeah. Bit of judgment going on when she's mm -hmm. worried about being judged, isn't she? I'm probably asking the questions, but then I don't. I think the feeling that there's, there's some elements that the university are putting in place. Ah. Uh -huh. Consciously putting in place? Mm, probably not. Okay, so are there barriers in in place? Interesting approach. Well, I think we may talk about barriers in a while. Yes. So starting with empathetically, what a lovely bunch of tutors you are. Are you typical? I wonder. Or are we theoretical? Well, I'm theoretical. <laughs> well, um, we'll come back to Celeste. I just want to leave her there. I think one thing I will point out is that there may be an issue with motivation, and no, she's not coming in. And that one of the things we pick up from this thing called positive psychology is that there is a difference between being intrinsically motivated and extrinsically motivated. Yes. So if we're motivated by things outside ourselves, very often that's a very thin motivation. So things like the grade that you get, and this is you know, the self-determination theory. Yes, is problematic. Comparing yourselves with other people, like your sister who's at Oxford. Yes, comparison. Um, money, some want to get money. All that, that's an extrinsic motivation. There's a lovely psychological study done around motivation. So, if we go to the Olympics and we look at the podium, and we've got gold, silver, bronze, who are the happiest people? The psychologists say it's the obvious one, it's the gold medalists. Who are the second happiest? Bronze. You knew it was a trick question, but one's medalist because their reference point is being on the podium. The silver medalist, who's small, bit away, 
is going, ah, it could have been me, and he's miserable. How many of our students do we know who go, uh, get the first? And say, but my flat, I'm going to hide that first. <laughs> yes? And are unhappy and are depressed and anxious, and their well being isn't being looked after. So we need to be a bit aware, don't we, about motivation. We'll come back to this. Now we're into our threat. So structure, that's quite a long prologue, doesn't it? Um, anyone come across this chat, Rob Hopkins? So I'm going to just, I use Rob Hopkins as a structure for looking at research. Rob Hopkins is the sort of the, one of the voices of the thing called transition networks, which is a big kind of green movement that started off in Devon and now is all over the world. I, I would recommend that you, you check it out. But what is very interesting is, is the structure of how he thinks about making change. And it's about using the imagination. It's about, and he uses that what if. And he says, um, what if the world was different? And he will have a listen to the podcast, they're wonderful, and he'll talk to gardeners about their vision of what if we did something different. It is about this idea of imagining new something, imagining better futures based on what is. So act one is what is, which is the state we're in, and also the foundations on which we can make change. What if is imagining a better future, right? We have to dream about it or it will never happen. Martin Luther King famously didn't say, I have a spreadsheet. <laughs> dream, because imagine a world that's different. So why not? Let's do it. We're not going to do it in this space where we're going to do it. But let's get real. What next? How do we make the first? How do we make the first steps to all that? Right. So that's the structure of how we're going to look at this drumming coaching thing. So let's have a look at it. one. What is okay? We know this. Don't we? There's a mental health crisis. Yes. Um, there is a ton of research to say this, but let's look at children and young people to begin with. Um, so this is one stat from the UK. This is a global pandemic or mental health crisis with young people. So here's some NHS data from the, U from the UK. So just think about this. In 2017, one in nine children was diagnosed with an, what they call a mental disorder. I put that in inverted commas. I just think we need to problematize these terms a bit. By 2021, four years later, it was one in six. Um, pandemic may have something to do with that, but it may not. But this has been going on for a while. So uh, Daniel Goldman in 2007 said that the present generation in, in 2007 of children is more troubled emotionally than the last, more lonely and depressed, more angry and unruly. Now, do we? And more nervous and prone to worry, more impulsive and aggressive. So that 10 year old in 2007 is now 26. So this has been an escalation in a mental health crisis. And there's a lot and lot of lots of research on this. Um, and from those of you who have been working with young people in the school, it's been more than this. Is. <laughs> it makes the gods angry for our young people. So, you know, and this is not a, necessarily about um, not having stuff. Actually, this is in the developed world. This is back in 2007. This is all over the world. So. Um, and if we look currently, I would say this is my supposition here. The young people are floundering rather than flourishing as a rule. Um, yeah, there's probably more data on that stuff, but there seem to be some factors here that are very current factors. The pandemic, people talk about during COVID, don't they? Like the pandemic was a thing that was yesterday. But actually, the, those kids who were school during the pandemic and the students were at university during the pandemic, there's a legacy. Of, of this, surely, in terms of their learning, education, and their well being. Um, social media, Google it, there's lots of stuff in there. Go on to Facebook and learn all about social media. <laughs> but we know that there's an impact in terms of distraction, in terms of self esteem, confidence issues, and so on. And the precarity that we see for young people. So, um, my mum was the first in our family to go to university. 
um, she uh, had me her second child at 25 as a graduate. How many graduate women do you know now who are going, oh, I'll have my second child at 25? Because now for young women, there's an extra issue, isn't there, which is around the locality of work. Oh, and, and around um, housing, having a roof over your head as graduates, let alone not being graduates. So we've got this precarious world that our young people are facing, which is going to add us into the anxiety. Um, news flash, there is inequality in the world. So you're glad you came to learn that piece of our information. Um, so I'm going to look at it through the lens of the thing I know most about, which is around disability rights. We won't go into this in great depth, but as some of you may know, there's a largely speaking disability rights which we found on this idea of a social model of disability as opposed to the medical model. The medical model says you're disabled because something's wrong with you and you need to be cured. The social model is the barriers approach. We talked about barriers earlier. It's quite useful. Uh, the way I like to look at it is, is and then there's of course a lot of about this, and there's more ways that you can cut this, but there's the physical barriers. We can see the picture here a staircase is not the lack of a lift, and so on. Bad signage, you might say, is a, is a physical barrier. But I think what's also interesting is the systemic and attitudinal barriers that disabled people face. So, um, for example, if you are um, a student in a university such as Goldsmiths um, and you are neurodiverse, you may find um, just the act of going through the bureaucracy of getting your reasonable adjusted student agreement in place is a barrier in itself that the system throws up. I'm sure you were very aware of those kinds of things we talked about it earlier. Attitudinal might be on an individual level, right? You know, there was a, this Radio 4 program years ago called it Doesn't Take Sugar, my signal actually, which was a, which was a disabled people's program. You know, that's something it up, isn't it? You're the disabled person. Does she take sugar? I'm not going to talk directly to you and give you an agency in deciding it, but somehow you're fair out. So on those kind of attitudes, and we'll come more to speak about that in the respect of what disabled people and what that means. But very often it relates to what they call the charity model. Yes, so those are the kind of barriers disabled people might face, but you can use this idea of barriers to extend it a bit further. So um, what's interesting is when you talk to Celeste, she doesn't always tell you exactly what's going on. She doesn't say my barrier to participating is that the, um, the, the school, college, university is institutionally racist. Sometimes she does, sometimes she doesn't. She doesn't say, if I had the bank of mum and dad, things would be easier for me. But she might say things like, I've got to work just full time just to eat, so why are you asking me the deadlines? She might say, I can't relate to any of the reading, that's why I can't get my act together. I've got a long commute into college, that's quite an interesting one. I read some research that, uh, particularly in universities in London, um, students are. Um, if they're commuting in from a home in London, with longer commutes in London, that can be an hour, an hour and a half just to get into college, they're more likely to be, the poor of that country, they're more likely to be done. And less likely, therefore, to be having the social benefits of falling out of bed in a hall in college. So I've got a long commute into college, and well be an equality issue, no to be this guy hassling me, the oldest got the qualities issues, uh, qualities issues might be around that. I'm chaotic and never get the emails. It's just a neurodiverse student who's calling herself chaotic. I don't want to go socializing to the pub. Yes, culturally, why might the pub not be the place where I'm going to come well, before my own years? Yeah, it might be a very straight place, it might be a very white place, it might be that they don't drink, they're not into drinking culture, whatever it is. We can see that so less barriers, opportune systems, as well as concrete barriers, can affect you. It's not just about disabilities, it's the barriers approach. Um, some of you might be aware then of this, this, this idea of circles of influence, which came from a very popular kind of circles kind of management book with seven habits of highly effective people that all of us read. 
if you're old enough to at some point, but it's used quite a lot within the kind of psychology. Um, and I, I like this, this thing of that sort of the framework to look at these issues around circles of control. Um, because there is an argument to say that there are things within our control. Yeah. Behavior, actions, attitudes, decisions. Not always easy, but it is within our control. So Cody would say. Um, and then there's stuff you just can't control. You, know, so you sort of need to go up with acceptance. Um, the virus, for example, has an equality of impact, doesn't it? We know that coronavirus and the pandemic, in ways that we had a big impact on people from particular movements. Yes, if you're a carer, it's going to be a for time. Um, the economy can't do much about that in the short term. The change it with the skin to skin, right? It's not easy, it's beyond the control, but it can add to the pressures. And you can think of a whole bunch of other stuff there. What's interesting is the circle in the middle of where we can have influence and where we can change things. So, for me, I think a lot of the work is around being realistic within what we do for us. So, you may have a problem with um, the system to get your access agreements in place, because it's not impossible that you might not be able to talk to somebody and negotiate. It might be a lot of extra emotional labor for the human people who are disabled or have, but it may be possible to start moving from floundering to flourishing and improving the situation by looking at what you can influence. Collaborating in dialogue with other people. Who are your allies? Yeah. Who might be able to help you when, when Celeste is in a situation where she's feeling depressed and she was, mm -hmm. can't get out to bed anymore. She tends to be communicative with her friends, with her family. There may be allies there, but it may be the sister might be an ally to help her with that dissertation at Cambridge. Or she may not be. But we don't know, but there's a possibility that they make something she can influence there in order to change the situation. Okay, so then we've got this movement called positive psychology. Are you all with me? Yeah, good. Um, I found that this is kind of an interesting, people haven't come across it, before, and it's the basis for how I think about coaching. Um, so this, this guy, Martin Seligman, kind of is thought to be the instigator, the pioneer of the positive psychology movement. And there's a whole ton of research, a whole ton of data. He took over, I think it was the American Psychiatric Association chair in something like 1997. And um, he had to come up with a big idea. And this was essentially his big idea. Psychology is not just the study of weakness and damage, it's also the study of strength and virtue. Treatment is not just fixing what's broken, it's nurturing what's best within ourselves. So prior to that, the approach, if you like, the psychology establishment had been to, to fix people who are broken, yes, to pathologize, to give them a label. And of course, you can see, you start to see it's about flourishing. It's in one of the books. You can see that actually, uh, it's not about necessarily the I mean, we work with all different things in one place. We work on strength rather than strength and weaknesses, and so on. Um, so, one of the things that's come up with, and there's a massive data set, if you check, check this out online, it's called BIA, Values in Action Character Strengths, is that uh, seven of them is team have identified 24 strengths, they think, character strengths, they think human beings have on the planet and they cross reference this with with cultures across the world so the data is big enough to study this isn't necessarily in the kind of north american eurocentric view of the world but in every culture they say you can get these 24 key character strengths which are um which are what we might build on so when i now work in coaching rather than we, we might look at someone else and say tell me what the strengths and weaknesses are about. What I might say is, what, what's your, your biggest strength? What's your biggest strength? But rather than labeling something of it, there may be a strength there that you might want to tune up in a different context. Yeah, so um, I'm really, the bots are really getting very negative. Hopefully, 
my acting training means that I'm reaching the back of the hall. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so we we might, for example, look at um, for myself. I very often heard myself say, "I'm not a detailed person." Yes, very bad at detail. What I mean is, I have a propensity to sort of be forgetful. Get dates wrong, sorry, Amanda, and friends here. I have to try to book time with you. I go, was it two o'clock really? Yeah. When I'm writing a play, I know there's a thing about the character. It's not that I'm not a detailed person, it's that in some contexts I can be detailed, and for some reason or other, I haven't managed to transfer that. But let's try and do that. Because it is possible, it's probably within that circle of control, difficult though it is. Yeah. Um, this is my own six coaching values that I think I'd like to apply to, to coaching work. Coaching is different from therapy, yes? Um, and as much as anything, for me, it's about a, an intervention that gives someone a toolkit to, to work autonomously. It gives them a conceptual toolkit or a practical toolkit or something. Yeah, so you can go away today with this idea of character strengths. Go away and think, well, actually, I can make some changes in my life with that, that idea. Um, it puts individual well being above organizational imperatives, and this is what differentiates a lot of the coaching that you see from, from people within the commercial business world or, or even within worlds like universities, which I guess are commercial business worlds, even if they're formed with charities, but which is that. Coaching is seen as a way of managers getting more productivity and higher performance out of their workforce. It's not for me, the value is around, it's an education value, it's for them and their development. Um, that actually a coaching culture within an organization can shift the health of the organizations. And that's been shown in a number of cases where people are focused on individual flourishing and it does benefit the things the organization stands for. So, um, it's very, very hard to do it now, but in, in a place, for example, where, um, where you know, time is money and you're wasting your time on that. Yeah. yeah. Equalities are built in and not bolted off. And so at every moment, it's, this is not something that's an afterthought of the form, it's central to the practice. Eclecticism, um, there is no Bible, there is no cult involved in this. There's not one a school of one for it's what works for any individual coach, if you like, to support movement and plan movement flourishing, whatever that looks like. Um, I might use the strength-based approach or self-determined learning. There are other people who use other kinds of approaches, but um, I think it's trying to be collected. And it's important that the coach's well-being is looked after. So I guess it applies to teaching mm -hmm. as well, doesn't it? And to the cultures we work in. Um, if we're not working towards flourishing and our own well-being, are we in use supporting the people? So those are my kind of values that I try and work towards. Um, and I, I thought I'd introduce to you a, an example of where, arguably, but I think there's some data, a course on positive psychology has been effective. Has anyone come across the Lauri, Lauri Santos? So Lauri Santos is, um, is a doctor of psychology at Yale. And her course, she runs a course called The Science of Wellbeing in the psychology department there. That is the most popular course in Yale's entire history. It's had more science than anything else. What she does is she does a lecture seminar course, and instead of giving having homework requirements, she calls them rewinders. So instead of writing an essay, you'll be asked to rewind habits, you go back and write a gratitude journal, for example, or try out an exercise, yes, um, something like that. So every week there'll be a new rewind to do. Her data indicates that she takes a baseline data, she does, you know. Classic psychology test on oh, how happy are you on day one of the course, and at the end, how happy are you? And her data says a 17% happier than the baseline of English. So that's what you get from the course, as well as a credit. And she talks, she gives a, one of the things she talks about, she gives that example of the Olympics, is one of the, one of the studies that she talks to her students about. 
to look at a comparison. She looks at um, at, uh, at a lot of the data and research around why people think they've got more money. Once you've got enough, so you have the basics. The research says that almost everybody wants one point four times the salary they can If you're on hundred grand, it can on is what the data shows, and that doesn't make you happy. Our online version of the course has 4.5 million enrollments. As today, or when I when I put this slide, I have more. Um, and she's doing a new course, which is teams online, which is quite interesting. So she's interested in, in working down the scale. So fascinating how successful it looks like on the surface. And she, and she has a podcast I urge you to listen to, which is very charismatic, she's a brilliant communicator, um, well worth listening to her insights. But there's a new drama. Not one point in, in her course do the students get off their chairs or pretend to be somebody else. Yes. So that's um, almost the end of psychology. But um, you know, when we're working in the field of arts education, um, we're always asked to evidence to prove that our stuff works, right? With some hard science, which is a bit frustrating. But we just sort of know, don't we? But that we have to evidence it. What's fascinating is that the, the cognitive neuroscience people who are tend to be better with data and you know they wire people's brains up and make decisions, flash over and all that stuff. And the CAT scan, all that stuff. All that MRI scan, all that stuff. Hard science, which people like. So Mary Helen Mordino Yang is one of those. And what she's evidencing now through the neuroscience, she says as follows: emotion and cognition are intertwined and involve interplay between the body and mind. Social processing and learning happen by internalizing our subjective interpretations of other people's beliefs, goals, feelings, and actions, and precariously experiencing aspects of these as if they are our own. Now, if you look at the bits I've highlighted, isn't that what we learn through drama? Interplay between body and mind. Yeah, let's use that body, lorry. Internalizing our subjective interpretations of other people's beliefs, experiences. Yes, we use other people as reference points to explore that precariously experience. Yeah. But well, that's not involved. Well, by people who follow her, yeah, but by people who control. Oh, absolutely. That's not the No, and I think I think what's happening is that they're not looking actually at the evidence base that's really there for how important it is to get engaged feeling and engage our bodies in that. We can we can look at reasons and policy while I think. So the next bit of the what is educational drama. Um, so there's lots of different modes of educational drama. Here are a few of them. I'm going to probably talk a little bit about the top three, writing process drama and forum theatre um, in a bit. Um, you all have different levels of knowledge about some of this stuff. Um, I, like, I sort of think that there are two different approaches that get mashed up together in terms of drama for learning. And they're to do with where your mindset is. And um, we learn a lot by pretending to be other people. We learn as others. Yes. Lots and lots of theory on that why we do that. But we do as human beings, um, presumably uniquely because we have these um, this, the imagination of the species. We imagine what it's like to be somebody else. Um, we also learn as storytellers. But we try and make narrative. So we it's not just being in the moment of being someone else. We go to around, we look at the whole picture and we go, what does this mean? We try and make some sense of the narrative as well. Oh, I've got that. Okay. Um, and the um the, the great drama teacher, Dorothy Keith Coat, um said a whole bunch of stuff that's incredibly interesting. And uh, if you don't know her work, I wouldn't. I would say, if you're interested in this stuff, have a look at what she did. There's a wonderful documentary film of her in doing the practice called Three Rooms Waiting, which is 
all of it's available on YouTube when you single out to the teaching. And it's new. when I show it to me, back in the seventies, early seventies, I show it to my students in the twenty twenties. They come out inspired by her as a wonderful teacher. But I thought this was really interesting. Um, she was talking at a conference. A lot of the stuff material you get is her talking at conferences rather than written papers. A great deal of my work is concerned with this. Yes, John and school. Because I see it as one of the principal ways in which schools could be humanized. It is using the conventions of the depicted world to motivate study of the real world and of humanity, providing a framework of purpose for and within the school curriculum. And the bits I've highlighted are things that sound like coaching talk from post seven So we know it was five years before he even talked about positive psychology. He was busy with something else before then. And schools can be humanized. We talked, didn't we, about coaching practice being about culture and organization, motivation, intrinsic motivation. Um, quite often, we coaching, we look at what's your core purpose, who are you, what's your ethics? Well, who, you know, why did, what gets you out of bed in the morning? A framework of purpose. And she was absolutely talking about these ideas. Um, if that says 1990, she was talking about them. Early stages. Are we ready back to the Are you happy to go straight on? Good. Um, so, my what if? That was my analysis of some of the stuff that interests me. What is? What's going on in the world? Some bad stuff, some positive, some possible strands and foundations for something. Um, if we use drama and coaching, we use the mind body in the together. Yes. Let's go back to Celeste. I've added I can't relate to any of the readings of the first three things that she was saying. Um, let's imagine your Celeste's tutor again, okay, with our new or possibly re um, renewed understanding of positive psychology and so on. So what kind of, would you ask for any different questions now? So if we were going to look at one of the approaches, which is this idea of character strengths, what questions might you ask Celeste, in order to find out what she thinks her greatest strengths are, a signature strength. That's good, right? Oh, you What you Go back to the two one and say, well, two one is good. I was, I don't know if it works, I always say to my students, the course I did, which was English and Drama at Birmingham University. When I finished it, no one had ever got to finish it in its history in, by 1983. Yes, so, which included Tim Curry, who did the same course with Franklin Furt and Ron Polisher. He can't get first. <laughs> Why should I? So, what questions might you ask her? Yes, so you might say, Yeah, what was it that, 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 got, that, that got you that great feedback? That's really great. Yeah. What else? Maybe? So that's that thing, isn't it? Uh, about we can transfer strength from one context into another. So if you can visualize the time when it would be really useful. Let's imagine that we've asked that question. What kind of, from, from now you've got this in depth insight into Celeste, what kind of strengths do you think the Celeste in your mind might, might say that she has her signature strengths in her studies in her previous time? Would you like actually tell me some? Reason that you did like. Oh, she might. And what kind of strength that she has shown there? Too? Which we might have sought out that wasn't in the reading list. Curiosity. It's, it's really interesting that very often the key strength that gets buried curiosity. Mm -hmm. She's got that. She's got that. She's got that. We've all got it. Yeah, but she's not bringing it to bear, is she? So I've made it up because. Um, and I've gone, these are the sorts of things that come up. Yeah, humor, 
teamwork, fairness, honesty. Yeah, quite a lot of students. Are, this is pretty typical. Fine, I'm fine. I'm good at working with team. She's isolated, isn't she? I'm doing the essay, isn't she? Yeah. Might be difficult doing that. Humor, honesty, fairness. Now, what's that going to help me write an essay? So. You can sometimes do it back to the sort of reason they get that sort of thing at Christmas. Well, I, I came here and I got the email and I really thought I was going to be able to. So you let that to the dream or the expectation. It gives you an idea of the degree of disappointment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then yes, you realize where you've fallen into. And that's where your optimism bias has, has flipped into a pessimism bias because has not lived up to it. So I'm going to get four questions, mate. Yeah. Or ways of behaving the ones that yeah. they're not completely. So it's not about stopping the what in the process, it's about getting it. Yeah. So let's say she says honesty. So if you're off Celeste, how might you use honesty? As a, something that you can feel is very strong signature strength to deal with, say, the issue of I don't engage with the reading. Could she use that in some way? You could critique mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because if the reading isn't interesting, if she disagrees with it, you could be a good piece in her essay which critiques. Yes, absolutely. That's a good, good point. Any other way she could use on this? I came up with one earlier. This is, it's a bit blue meter, this bit of the not thin workshop. But <laughs> here's one I made earlier. She decides to go and have a chat with Professor Normington use, using her honesty. And she says, Honestly, Professor Normington, I'm finding the reading a bit dry. Can you recommend something written by someone of my background? Right. It's a challenge. <laughs> it's a challenge. So what we might do then is flip into this form of theatre. Some of what we've been doing is a bit like mantle of the expert, by the way. You've been in role as the coach. You could do it with a group of students. What applies to groups less? Yeah, it's less stupid. It's not exactly the model, but it's 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 the framework, isn't it, of shifting your frame fictionally. And um, forum theatre is a form, those who don't know, where you put a play on the stage or put a scenario on the stage and you invite the audience to participate by changing a protagonist who's got a problem, changing the situation for them, come in and bias. Yes. So here, this won't necessarily be the answer to the problem, but what we can do is have it as a starting point, as a starter. For some forum theatre with somebody enrolled with Professor Normanton. She had to say in response, we could try five or six different potential responses. And in that way, the whole group is kind of rehearsing how do we be assertive with Professor Normanton. Professor Normanton's of this world, who we may have perceptions and ideas about. Yeah, it's that drama of attendance and analysis. Yeah. yeah. And perhaps this may be a bit utopian. So that's the second step in found her instruction. So maybe she is feeling a bit jollier and precariously the group of better but two items are working in the group. All right, so that's what she goes. Um, very quickly, a sort of storytelling approach. Um, people know about um, the hero's journey. Yes, this is Joseph Campbell. It's, a, it's a, one of the, the, the classic, you know, one of the, they say, seven story structures that there are. Um, so we can use this to have a reimagining. It's a winning script, yes? Some of the basic stories are not winning scripts, right? Um, so, for example, the, uh, uh, they're called the spider and the fly, which is, uh, which is the basis of the Bible. It's Adam and Eve and somebody else who gets in the way of a relationship. So that goes badly. It goes badly for Othello, as well as for Adam and Eve. Right? Um, that's, a, that's not a winning script. This is a winning script, and, we all, and it's a learning script, isn't it? The hero's journey. Um, so we could say we can do some work with Celeste, you are the hero. Of course, heroes can be gender specific. 
And we start to look at the fact that the hero has allies and a mentor. That's a good structure. Um, Wizard of Oz is quite a good one to use because uh, people know it. There's a the Wiz is a black version of it. A lot of the, I mean, they're all over the world, but not everyone will know Black Elk speaks or something, but people tend to know Wizard of Oz. And you know you've got your allies, and you know you've got your mentor. Yes. Um, so who might be your allies? You know, who is your or your Hermione? Who is your Rambo? Who is your Tim Man? And what would your sickness of strengths look like as superpowers, which is quite a fun game to play? So if if um, honesty is your superpower, um, maybe it freezes people. I didn't have that conversation. So every time I talk this to it just freezes someone for a moment. What do you imagine your trials might be? Because we remember the thing on the hero's journey is it's a learning journey, and learning means we change. And quite often, that what if assumes that we're the same person that we are now at the end of the journey. And unless we can change that mindset, we have to flourish. Yeah? So visualize yourself change because of learning. So there are different ways. I very I often use this, by the way, to look at um, uh, the very prosaic thing of managing your time, because it starts you start to support learners to find out what's important to them, and then they go well. We talk to Celeste. I'm curious. I want to find out stuff. This is really important to me because I'm really engaged with this particular subject. But I've made no time to read about it or whatever or do anything for it. So block. What would what would it look like if you blocked? You know, an hour and a half reading in the morning every day on the bus. And we do block calendar in the bus. So. That's cool. Um, very quickly, um, a new model of disability is emerging as a non tragic new. So, this is the affirmative model of disability. And at this point, just I've talked to a little bit personally about this, really, because as the same person myself, in, just about the turn of the century, um, I very carelessly lost my bowel on my intestines. Couldn't find it anywhere. I mean, the pillow looked everywhere, and I, I had emergency sur life saving surgery, and I ended up with a stoma. I changed my life. I couldn't do the work I used to be able to do. Um, I, uh, I couldn't, I, I did a lot of work with, with young people who wouldn't love it because you're in the stomach, couldn't do that anymore. Couldn't be left alone, actually. If you have a bad leakage or something, you have to be able to leave the room, which you can't do with, you know, some safeguarding. So I had to change how I thought about my world and my life and all the rest of it. And the response very often, if you're a disabled person, is, oh, yes. And this entire research to say when people become disabled, they're not unhappy. Christopher Reed talked about being happier. And to come to terms with this impairment and with a superman. Right? This very often happens, but it's it's one of those things about um, an affirmation of your identity. So when we have these barriers, it's an affirmative approach to our strengths. So I now look at the fact that I'm here and uh, you know I've managed to use my signature strength creativity to be teaching and writing and making work, that form, all those things I think I'll do again. Which is great, but it's, but it's actually not a tragedy, people. Um, so it's very important, the affirmative model, and it relates to the idea of strength. It's there in the literature on disability rights. Okay, so we've got these three things that I think would be the heart of this new thing we're driving coaching. I'm going to go back to that very quickly. Um, one of the, the, the ways that coaching is often framed is that it's dialectic, it's one of them. Now, that's within a lot of the literature, particularly around things about performance, management, life. You know, you got a life coach, having a life coach, that kind of stuff. Um, we know about group coaching because we see it in, 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 in group arts, don't we? We see it in dance troops, we see it in sport, the coach, um, we see it in the classroom, yeah. Not the sage on the stage, but the the guide on the side, the coach on the side, coaching. So we see it working in groups all the time. And I think there's a lot of benefits to working in groups. I'm not saying the dyadic approach is invaluable, I think it very often is. 
that the work I'm interested in is about this idea of working groups because drama's group work. Yes. So we start with the group of identities in the work sense there. It, um, I think it's much easier for a learner to be playful and imaginative with other with your peers, as it is one of your teacher in the office. You know, you can actually let the imagination go more. It builds peer support beyond sessions. So you've suddenly got the relatedness angle of flourishing happening. Um, and the one thing that, if you need to persuade any organization that you ever work with, that they should be doing lots of drama and coaching. I would say, all right, it's cost effective. It's a cheap way to get your end, you know, your, the ends that you want, isn't it? Let's imagine that here we are at Bodsmith, and we say every first year student does a 10 week coaching course. And let's imagine that out of a group of, let's imagine that what, 5% of those people would have dropped out and didn't and don't. Each one of those is worth 30,000 pounds for college. Do the maths. So actually, well-being culture that supports something like this and shares well as all the other benefits and the way that that will attract people to a, to a healthy um, organization as a, as a business argument to be made this stuff. And businesses know this, by the way. A lot of them like businesses that use different kinds of coaching models to um, make their start feel valued. Okay, oh, that's three. That's three, sure. short, it's over to you, more or less. Um, but I would just say that um, we go back to when um, we started Rob Hopkins, what next? And I'm kind of I'm feeling a bit ambitious. I'm 61 years old. No, it's not, yes, he is. He's 61 years old. And I've got six years until I put out my state commission. And I want to do something that's kind of interesting and important in that time and has a bit of impact. So I think this is, I hope this stuff's got legs. If you don't agree, fine, you know, do the other side. So, what, why are you be ambitious about this stuff? Yeah. Um, it's the, the theatre in education movement was, was significant. And it started in 1965 at Belgrade Theatre in Coventry, very small work. And in fact, what it started with was Michael Gordon Balance going to the council in Coventry and then having some extra money suddenly because of the rate of the school leaving age. It's happening at that time, so that was some extra money. And Gordon Balance put in there said, Well, you would love to give your theatre some money to do theatre and education. And he said, What about theatre in education? And it's key. Um, and from there, he moved on. And actually, was significant and still has it. I would submit and things today. I lectured for another day. Okay, so here's, here's some steps. Here's the spark. Some people in the room go to it. Um, when I put together this, um, the idea of doing this, it was interesting how many people in my quite small social media circle, the people who do things like on drama workshops, working with this companies, and so were interested in what this was a time I did. Um, we can do some experiment and work across sectors. We can see what it looks like in schools. We can see how the practice looks like, say, in a charity, working with volunteers, we get help, charity achievement centers, and so on. Um, we can have some dialogue across that. We can collect some evidence, maybe get some proper data people, like proper psychologists involved who get some really crunchy numbers attached to does this, uh, does this stuff make you 17% happier with 10 students? Does it achieve the objectives of the organizations and the individuals together? Um, we could spread that through the publication. I'm having a chat with Robert about book about this. I do, I think uh, if the book proposal is okay, then they ask me to write it. But we can be training people in techniques. We can be looking at models of good practice. We can be sharing ideas. Hey, and then by, by the time I've retired, it will part the furniture. <laughs> Who knows? But it may start to. Why not? You know, really, 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 as Rob Hopkins would say, it starts with some idea of the first step. That's um, I would like to. Am I being over optimistic? I think it's just over optimism, and I'm really just I feel disappointed. So, any, I just, what I'd like to do is spend the rest of the time. If you've got any questions, please do ask them. 
But I'd quite like you to, to have a chance to talk to each other about this stuff. I've, I've witted on for an hour, more or less. Um, but is there anything for clarification or any key questions for me? If not, I've got some questions for you. Yes, well, no, but uh, there's a deadline on the 22nd of May for the Strategic Research Fund, and I talked to someone who, who got one before I came here today and gave me a tips. And to whether what I want to do is build partnerships so that we've got uh, between education and psychology mostly, and not necessarily just with adults making things wrong. But um, I'm uh, a fellow now of the Carnegie kind of School of Education at the Institute of Education, which is research and culture and country and education. So maybe we want to have a uh, connection to. So yeah, I hope so. It would be good to 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 do some of this. I hope it's a convincing enough case. Any any other? Fabulous. You will you'll catch me. Um, so I'm just interested in, in you just turning that maybe you know we've got maybe two or three groups of three or four. Um, I've been I'm just giving this as promise that you may have more to say than this. Yeah. One one what would be a group of learners you think would benefit from drama and coaching? What strategies might work for them? So I've been thinking a lot about emerging adults. That is the 18 to 28 group of our graduates in that particular stage in life. But um, I'm really interested in how it might spread further. So you may have that expertise. Oh, there's a thing on some sources there which I can give you a few. Um, you'll see when before we leave, I will show you this. Which has got my email. So if you were interested in being part of this journey, mm -hmm. and that's the bit of the beginning of it. And, and then if I do get this, if I do get some some support, we've got time. Yeah. And, and maybe the, the centre for arts and learning. So we'll, we'll just look at an alliance of the willing would be lovely. Um, so just as when you say drama in coaching. Can we using things like boring kids and play factors as well? It's a good performance. Absolutely. It's, it's the whole thing about being eclectic. I'm not a, I mean, I'm, I'm a very big fan of boring theatre. We've done a lot of it. Um, so, interesting fun fact Augusto Boal, who is the pioneer of boring theatre, ran his first um, workshop, uh, forum workshop in the UK at Dalton in 1995. Wow, I was not to be there. So that was, I was lucky. So that was the first time I've ever been to Goldsmith, probably, because mm -hmm. that's that much. So, so we have, we, we have form. Um, but yes, uh, but there is no, I don't, I mean, I, I spoke, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I spoke to a colleague who, who was, who was next to drama department uh, a couple of weeks ago, who, who uses, who, who works with, he's amazing, he's an illustrator, he's amazing, Sort of the abstract illustrations. There are more than more shots, you know. There. And and she's doing extraordinary, developing extraordinary techniques using, you know, kind of coaching through, through imagination through through these archetypes. So there's there's no and uh, and I'd be really interested to see what other practices people might have a harness to this. Okay, um, let's, if you wouldn't mind, I'd just love to hear from you. Now, basically, now's, now's where I stay in your ideas. So, um, yeah, start talking. Yes. You, you're kind of giving a really interesting insight into how forum theatre and um, the mantle of the expert and kind of positive coaching techniques can uh, increase inclusion, sense of well-being positivity around learning environments and um, what do you think is preventing these techniques from being more actively used because there's clear data there's literature they've been happening as you said since the 1980s when you first came to a workshop at goldsmiths and it seems like there's such valuable insights 
I mean, I invited all the PGP students to the talk because I thought all of our trainee teachers are learning coaching styles. And I often, when I um, have had PGC tutees in art and design, said, right, you're kind of method acting in your role playing into being a teacher in the first instance, because it, it doesn't, it's not like it comes naturally unless you practice. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with any kind of um, student learning experience that it's, it's kind of almost role playing yourself into having the confidence to do that which the man of the expert techniques and the four theatre techniques enable. So what do you think is preventing this happening more often across in a, on an interdisciplinary basis? Um, well, I think it goes back to the education reform act, actually, in the 80s, you know, yeah. where, um, where, you know, which is beginning, for me, my experience of where the arts were marginalised from the curriculum and where, where things are made so subject specific that we didn't use the arts across the curriculum. So even though it happens in pockets, and you'll know better than I do when you're training teachers, that you're not necessarily, you know, we know from say mantle of the expert that it can be used across the curriculum. But I it may be only very enlightened or those with time that manage to to use those techniques, even with the within the really obvious subjects like English and history, let alone actually there's some. You know, there's wonderful work being done, um, the commission model that Keith Kelly developed after Mantle the Expert, which, which was really to give actual projects to young people. You know, let's really design this play playground as if we were architects or as if we were designers. And it's, you know, and um, so it's all there, but I think for me, it started, in my experience, as it started with. The Education Reform Act. It's eighty-eight, but we know it's ideological as well. You know, we know that, that you know we've we've been campaigning for, from STEM to STEAM and all of those you know the STEM subjects, the science and education, and the maths, which have been at the heart and, and government policy. So yeah, we can look at all that history, um, and uh, but I think the green stuff is kind of important that sort of way of challenging um, an ideology of learning that's about um, creating the cox for industry, factories for learning. So all about being driven by the economy, have a whole other conception of what learning is about, which is about well-being and it's not long and it's so on. And so, so I don't think it's just party political, actually, I think, you know, there were definitely things that, that happened around the edges during the Fair Brown years. Mm -hmm. We saw a thing called creative partnerships. It, it was a it was wonderful. It was, all, it was already it was diluted from the minute they started. It was going to be an arts entitlement for every child in the school in the manifesto or the manifesto. And then when it happened, um, it became pilot schemes rather than the bulk of the arts at the center. So there's a lot of policy stuff that. that um, but I think it does, it does take a paradigm shift in terms of what we see learning as being as part of our society. But we've had them before, paradigm shifts. You know, we look at 1945 and, and the paradigm shift that happened towards the welfare state and, and the kind of broad and socialist sense of society based on, you know, to each according to their needs and from each, from their ability. So whether we, we can change to the kind of way transition networks are working to say, um, actually, we've got to change how we think about stuff. And learning, experience, we, we know this from positive psychology stuff, that, um, that people value experiences more than stuff. And learning is key to being human. It's key to develop a core strength of curiosity. So I don't... I, I do think we start grassroots and we start to see what works. I don't, I, don't, I don't see it happening as we can make it happen in our, as much as we can in small ways and, and spread the word. That's a good, good viral thing for me. Do you, want, do you want to say something? I was going to say it's an intervention, but ironically, we don't have the expert in trying to teach in schools. It wouldn't really take off there, but it's taken off in other places like the police force. Yeah. 
their worries and their trend in it. It seems to have gone far a little bit in the rest, but not so. So it, it's it's not everywhere. It's, it's got everywhere. more traction in primary schools. Um, they do a lot more training in with primary teachers than in secondary, and that obviously yeah. comes back to that compartmentalization of subjects areas. It's sort of easier in primary to have a multidisciplinary approach. Okay. And I mean, we only use them in primary uh, making training as well. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I think the dialogue I want with the school. But, you know, you have to start with where people are and where institutions are. And, you know, one of the, the mistakes we always made in theatre and education, when I was 22, was to go to a school and say, yeah, we know best and tell the teachers what you know. But actually, you know, there are so many constraints. But, um, and in fact, something that I wrote about probably about five or six years ago um, was actually what we can offer support with. You know, teachers in schools know that there's mental health crisis. And if you can, so what I'd like to do, if I do manage to get this as a research project up and running, is to, is, is a, it's one place to straight away to school, and maybe even take the difficult stuff to work in secondary schools and say, how do you feel about our time to capacity to try some of this stuff out in terms of whether it can support the mental health of young people? And if there's a resources to back it up and it's not taking away from them, then I think. That you know, um, I would get agreement. So yes, you're offering a, a pilot something that could, could really make a difference. So I'd love to see that. So I think that's you know the, that one of the next steps is in that vision, are you taking people who are already trained in this into schools, or are you imagining that teachers get trained in it? Or what's what the do you think? The basis of all of it is, well, I'm an art therapist therapist and, and it's using the arts, every teacher is using the arts. So you know, quite a lot of teachers have done the training around it. It's really powerful yeah. to see the impact that it has. And then the, the, the presentations they do at the end of it are fucking really moving. Um, and they've been incredibly creative and it's really shifted their whole sense of what it means to be in relationship. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm just, it, I'm just curious about how you, and then when that was all live and then it went online during COVID, now it's a mix of the two. It, it, it um, has surprised me how well it's worked online actually. But the, I suppose that's the interesting question, isn't it? How do you, um, because the idea of being able to use drama, which is actually really reduced in schools, hasn't it, in terms of being uh, yeah. part of the core curriculum, and you know, to be uh, to find a way to, um, you know, to really, um, what's the word, kind of imbibe it back into the whole culture alongside the rest of the arts, you know, and then. What's interesting about drama is it sort of has all the other arts, doesn't it? Yeah. They're all, um, and I think it's just it's very frustrating to have built in this person, you know, that's some amazing model of what creative education mm -hmm. look like. So you've got it, and they get very, very good results there. And, and in fact, like you say, you've got so much evidence now, haven't you, against the arts that so often, uh, Allows kids who struggle in school to find something that they engage with and you know that not talk too much, but I'm just curious about how we actually, you know, what have you got any thoughts about how we do this? Well, I, I suppose it goes back to, well, I, I did probably um, this very quick, so um, this really is. We start with experimenting in the first sectors. We, we, we try stuff out um, and we have dialogue and we talk about it. We say, you know, did this work? Did this work? What can we do? It's better. Um, so that experiment involves dialogue, it involves collecting the evidence, analyzing it. You know, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, the autumn term, just running 10 week 
I'll be only hour, hour and a half courses, you know, a week with students just to try out different ideas um, with undergraduates, but it could spread further and allow other people to do it. And I think the next stage is once you've got toolkits, once you've got, oh, well, actually, this work using this works in this way. Um, and we say, well, let's train people on. Let's give people that this, let's share it and so the world can do it. And that could be. Could be people working within school teachers do it themselves. It could be some specialists or It doesn't really matter, does it? It's not just happening, I suppose. But I think that's why the training is important as well. With the models of good practice in that we and it was way you know when I was involved with the vision education movement that was that was how it how it generated. We we meet once a year. A conference in the university in the summer, and people would, would, would share their work, and that's where people say, well, I'm doing this form of theatre thing, I'm doing this, that, and the other. We run the workshops and we share. And then you take it back to where I think you're in the country. And, for, and, then, and there is, you know, an international network, of that, which you can now talk to the Asset Asia, which is the association of theatre for the audiences, and it's really global. It's not, I mean, of course, because money requires to travel over the world. And I've met colleagues from Rwanda or India, Latin America, in different these conferences, and they're, you know, practice gets shared through those networks. Things grow, people like ideas, and that, you know, the form gets to spread because as it's massively used global when we're using theatre development all over the world. So, yeah. Um, Let's let's do it. Let's see. <laughs> well, you know, what if what if I write this application next week and it's told this don't give me five hundred mm -hmm. back of the sofas to develop this idea? Well, then you won't get anywhere catastrophizing. So so yeah, well a man who knows I'll I'll just crack on crack on and do it without. It will be but yeah. But maybe it's maybe now, you know, you never know when your time is right. I think, um, like this is just through observation and experience for a reputation, but young people, like students, teenagers, that can be really resistant to, um, like active participation in things. I remember in sixth form, you know, a teacher came in and was trying to get us to do like a ball game at the start of the lesson. So it was like, oh, you know, people hated it, people refused to do it. But I also think that's especially from what I've seen, it's like people struggling that are more resistant to it. But looking at the Celeste example, it got me thinking about how showing in a group um, certain ways of thinking and negative loops that students can get into, um, a lot of them are very relatable and it might be really valuable to use them and present them like the you know the what is to increase that like relatedness between students and the teacher and then and then move on to the positive no, I mean it's really important you know <laughs> don't start off so I think the training is really important for people and you know that whoever doing this work have a training and understanding of that particular thing that you know drums the, the word that makes people want to go And then equally there will also be a you know, thing like I don't think it's meaning to map exactly where they might be sort of yeah. <laughs> but um but yes to to work in a way that's not exposing to that it's essentially about imagination. Mm -hmm. Yeah if you start you know, start off with something that is exposing and then that idea will be very careful. Yeah. Part of the problem with this book is that you need to have drama activity as part of the curriculum when you're very young and, and not something spectacular. About that you touch on it, that is, you know, themed in body experts and the teachers just stand as what the teachers do in the classroom on an everyday 
place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the whole of this thing, but it could be just mm -hmm. something that's role play, that's done with the desk, or whatever. But I um, think as the young people get older, that's part of what they do, really, then it's not a big shock. Yeah. Yes. But if it's Oh, suddenly in your face, and I've never done anything like that before. Well, it's only ever done by these people who have had a shit to do. Yeah. You know, then you're on a high point of nothing immediately. Now, I think it's one of the ones that process farm is so useful because what's happened um, over the last couple of decades is more and more the work is sold out. Out of school, using drama has been about forming communities. And of course, that's already going to present a barrier. And that's the assumption for me. So, when we see drama, they think, oh, we're about to do the school production of this again. As opposed to the process of drama, there's no audience. You're not being judged. So watch Dorothy work on Billy's waiting and you see that the way she gets this absorption involved with just the thing of bring teacher actually, but start being like a question um, and get and building the link in fiction. Building the link in It's a whole different world. We've lost a lot of skill in it. It would take a long time to build up a, a bank of development with a nice skill. Again, because you're a drama teacher, the former old boss at the Theatre Stuff used to call the Sing Out the Leaves School of Drama. <laughs> what does that mean? That's, that comes from the, the, the musical Gypsy. Oh, okay. It's so Mother with the back. Sing out, Louise! <laughs> Everything's coming up roses! Do, you know, and the whole thing of making a child before. And you know, it's that. Um, yeah. Gypsy, by the way, is the one. <laughs> <laughs> because it talks about that's just something. But uh, yeah, so. Yeah. So would you look at this with younger children as well? Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, embedded rather than yeah, it just being like a movement. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's really interesting all these kinds of things in the work. Um, and I think that's part of the whole experimental process of this getting the answer to the room. It would be um, certainly, I, I think. For example, transition from primary and secondary. That's we know that there is a real different matter. And I'll catastrophize it all. You want to speak about the next step? You've done this in school, Diana. I haven't, it's not new to me. I mean, I don't think I've been experimenting with my students personally. Yeah, okay. But I mean, I've done similar kinds of work in lots of contexts. Mm. And I hadn't realized, as I say, that I was doing this coaching. Um, so very often we would be working in theatre schools where they come to the ones to perform. We were doing so much more because we did need to do that for all of not only theatre strategies, but in the years and the some good things from where we did start that. But um, but very often you would find that, the, that what the work was about you know, was only exploring all kinds of issues about identity. Development of stages of play. 
Mm. And that, that was like a core that went through. Mm -hmm. So when they were going up into the secondary school, they all knew how to pretend, they all knew how to be in the world. It was absolutely lovely. We picked up and gradually take that into literature and pieces and drama. It was a it was a friendly conversation that involved the troops on board with mm -hmm. and making curriculum, you know, to get whole names in this is after that. Um not saying that it's the one that's pointed out. I think there are some women in some form from the actually the whole whole best to try and keep something like that going. Essentially it's underscored and common and it's 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 pretty much the best dreams. And then it's been stored in that that's very popular. You want to take some points out. You do not know how to I am they do not have to play the question and there's something not to play, or they're looking for something to play with, or they're quite a friend to be playing. And parents who know how to play the book and match the economy, they're there and they're sort of reminding them. I was going to tell us the little music thing. I have two friends who are watching this. What else is there? But, um, um, I think that the, the sensible money is on the next government of the UK not to bring conservative on, um, whatever that looks like. And there may be conversations to be had. And uh, you know, my early days in the TIE, I, I, I uh, wrote and directed a play about the beginning of the world to say, you know, the tension was me, we, we give you some feedback on from means to an end. And they were about to be what happened in the United States, you guys will remember. One of the actors in that is now the mayor of West Yorkshire. So, you know, this is where it's an actress. You know, there are people we can talk to who get this stuff, <laughs> in a way, and tracing the early years in West Yorkshire. So, there are, you know, it's, it's, you can speak the same language and well be with that. Um, and we thought that in the Blair Brown years as well. Certainly, from my perspective, Chris Smith, in my mind, is the best one to see the past in this kind of years, you know, in terms of, and, and have pushed through for the time. It's, it's, it's very good. So, you know, a little bit of optimism that there may be people we can have a conversation with, we may, we may talk about these fundamentals around teacher training. And some of the people who are shooting. But it's clear what you say. What we've got to be about here is the sort of the training is it's really exciting now. But the little bit from that about you mentioned the green people mm -hmm. and then the health. Mm -hmm. Those are two very strong tracks for us to be moving on to to sort of be on the NCC and pretty foundation. And there's a kind of consensus around us about you know like I moved from having been a Londoner, now I'm in the back side recently. Um, and I'm just on the border of the place of the site of the youth site. And I've uh, got involvement with a, with a biodiversity project in the garden, which is an extraordinary, in this garden, um, this is an extraordinary example of this because um, the volunteers and, and the adults go there and, uh, and the disabled. Younger people and say the adults who go there to ski, and they've got social prescribing now. You go to your GP and they prescribe you going to this wall garden. Um, um, a lot of people have been bereaved and done that and improving their mental health. And there's an arts element to it, and there are concerts happening, and there's making, and there's visual artwork happening. Um, in quite a conservative, probably the smallest area, but it's part of the movement you can see. People are really, you know, it's grassroots projects like that to um, show you the, the relationship between sustainability and well-being and creativity. And, um, and I think it's uh, so for, for for ordinary folk, that's that's not a difficult argument to make because they see it happening. And sometimes it happens in unlikely places. And you feel, I suppose, you feel like you know, I am, I am, hopefully eating more for my tea. North London Jewish intellectuals, they don't like us. But having said that, it's happening in churches. 
actual users to the dialogue to be had with people from all backgrounds. Patrick was looking at Paul Smith. No. <laughs> really, should we on, on that bombshell? Mm -hmm. um, should we wind up? Thank you so much for your patience with me tonight. And, um, well, thank you, Danny. No, yes. Thank well. you for your wonderful presence and presentation <laughs> and lively movement. We're glad that you're able to move around the room and uh, and not be confined to uh, a traditional form of presentation, let's say. So, and also thank you for inviting us to respond to the questions and issues that are raised by your research. And we hope that you do get to publish this soon. Um, I think there will be a great readership for it. And uh, we look forward to seeing that in the future. Yeah, amazing. And if you want, if you just want to keep in touch about stuff, there's probably some role in breaking up paper protection. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're just friends in the room, you're not allowed to give me an address. Yeah, yeah. 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 And thank you to our online guests. And um, Chris thought, says thank you, you Danny. Uh, uh, we hope to see you again soon. The next um, Centre for the Arts event is on the 24th of May, and it's actually my book law. Hey! So I will have some copies, hopefully, from Rutledge. Um, and I already have some, but they said they've got some kind of display copies, they call. I don't know if they expect them back. If they're the slave copies. Um, so, yeah, there's some books, and I would be reading from my own book and talking about sensory transitions into university cultures, the art methods for that, which kind of relates mm -hmm. to what you were talking about then in terms of the transitional experiences of school students um, and also those kind of needs to be honest and vocal around changing learning content in a decolonizing way in that um, slide that you, you mentioned there. So uh, there are some connections. Uh, if you would like to attend that, it'd be wonderful to see you. I will attempt the same kind of hybrid um, situation as we have here. Apologies, the sound wasn't brilliant. Maybe next time we need, we need to have a, this is what the online people are saying, next time we need to have a microphone for our speakers. Oh, okay. um, if we're doing a hybrid kind of, it's all, it's all learning. It's all a learning curve, isn't it? Yes. It's, 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 and I'm just going to stop recording now.